Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome back to Guild Chat. I'm your host, Ruby. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Uh, we're going to be talking about creature design in Heart of Thorns today. I have a quick update for you, though. We've been talking about scribing costs the past couple of episodes of Guild Chat, and just in case you missed it, there's an update in the Guild Wars 2 discussion forum on our official forums uh, that goes into some specifics about recipes and costs of items. So if you are interested in what we're up to with scribing costs and adjusting those, go check that out. Um, that's our update on that for this week, but now we have two of our guys from the creature team. Um, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves, and then we'll get into what you've been doing and how you're doing it. All right, I'm Ben Ponglung Tom. I'm a game designer on the Creature Team. And I'm Brian Walter, and I'm an animator on the Creature Team. Yeah, thank you for coming back, Brian, and yeah. welcome for the first thank time. Um, why don't we go ahead and just talk about how you, how you even get started, because to me, before I really got to talking to you guys and learning more about this, it was just yeah, you can make a thing and put it in the game. This isn't that hard, but it turns out there's a lot more going on. Um, one of the things that we talked about that I found especially interesting was how you use existing rigging to save some time in creating something. And so we don't just create an asset from the ground up and throw it away and be completely inefficient about it. So do you guys want to talk about how you've used existing riggings in Heart of Thorns first? Uh, yeah, sure. So for people who don't know, a rig is kind of the digital, um, it's the digital puppet we use to animate the character. Um, we have a picture here that shows yeah, off is... on the loved Quaggan. <laughs> so Quaggan rig. You can see the little lines throughout the character. Those are his joints. Those are the bones that drive the character. Mm -hmm. And then all the little lines on the outside, those are the controls I grab to move him around and make him do cool poses and stuff. Okay, so the lines that are extending out from his body are where you can actually control him and make him do. Yeah, oh so wow. that's, I'll grab those, rotate them, move them around mm -hmm. to kind of get the pose that we want for nice. the animation. All right, um, so what do we do? What do we do with him? So, like you're saying, we do share since building rigs. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and we do a ton of animations on a rig. It would be a waste to then not repurpose that on other creatures later mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah. So I put together this little video, which will show off a way we use the Quaggan rig. Okay, here's your Quaggan down here. <laughs> <laughs> oh! So the bristleback was actually based off using the Quaggan rig. And so for a while in development, uh, bristlebacks were actually running around doing little quaggin animations before what? we updated the animations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How weird did that look? Uh, it was that pretty was funny. Yeah. Oh, man. I forgot about that. You mentioned that the other day, and then I forgot. Now I kind of want to see that. So yeah. if, let's talk later if you have some of those <laughs> lying around. All right. So that's where you can take those, like those purple lines we were talking about. That's where you can take those and start adjusting and make them not just pointy quaggins. Yeah. So basically the bristleback is an example of one that we use the quaggin as a baseline. Mm -hmm. But then to make the creature have its own unique personality and stand out, we went over because he's a larger creature and wouldn't really work with the same animations. We had to do a whole new animation set for him. And if you notice on that picture, we had all those extra spines that were added. So yeah. we added onto the rig um, to make it the character we needed. So having that building block is actually really important <clears throat> as far as saving time. It seems like if you had to build every single thing from scratch, we'd have a lot fewer creatures. Yeah. Yep. All right. So we kind of took the Quaggan rig, turned him into a bristleback. And can we take a look at the other one? Yeah, so yeah, I have another example. Oh, here's that image I should have clicked to earlier, but didn't. All right, so... <laughs> so we had the bog scale, uh -huh. and he's his rig is shared with the vampire beast in Heart of Thorns. Nice, so you just, like, took off his tail. Is <laughs> yeah, so there's there's a lot of creatures who may have tails, and then versions of the rigs won't have the tails. Mm -hmm. But that's an example where the creature used a majority of the animation set of the bog scale. Oh, yeah. And okay. 
you get a variety of looking creatures, but also you still have a full library of animations he can use and it still works. Nice. And then the only animations we need to do are the skills that yeah, Ben will come skills. up with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So if we look at that, if we look at the vampire, if we look at the vampire beast versus the bog scale, his rigging has, it's not just like purple lines. There's a lot more going on there. So what are those? Because I'm sh assuming it's not just for pretty. Oh, yeah, those different colored lines in there. Where so he's got um, those joints control him, but based on the rigging he has, mm -hmm. there's like different IK chains and stuff that um, basically just change the colors of the joints so you know what the controls are. Okay, so I already <laughs> made you do this yesterday, <laughs> but I want to hear you need to take us through what IK is and okay. is the other one AK. FK. FK. Yeah. IK and FK. So in animation, 3D animation, there's FK and IK. And so an IK is like on a foot control where you want the foot planted and you move the character around and keep the foot planted okay. in place. And so that's an inverse kinematic. Okay. And then uh, FK, forward kinematics, is just like an arm where you move the lower part and everything just follows in the parent mm -hmm. down the chain. So... All right, so changing the color just helps you identify what you're looking at. Yeah, I think Maya just uh, automatically does it. <laughs> so, yeah, you can tell if something's awesome. running on it so or not. There's a lot going on with movement in there. Yeah. All right, neat. So that's kind of where we start from. You've got the building blocks. And once you've figured out, all right, what rig do we want to use? Do we Do we have an existing rig? Do we need to build a new one? Then what's the process? I mean, how does this evolve from concept into game? So kind of once we get, um, once we've decided on the armies we want, like usually that starts with a big meeting of you know, everybody getting together, um, deciding what armies we want, deciding what they want to do. Th once we choose some monsters and then decide which rigs will fit them best, we go into uh, prototyping. Um, but before that, we usually get some pictures from concept art. Yeah, so, so this is the axe uh, Yeah, this is an example of the Axe Commander. Uh, this is one of the earlier concepts. And you'll notice they put a lot of material treatment on there where they'll, they'll get real-world examples of what they kind of expect his skin to look like. Um, and that's just for the benefit of the modelers of when they're putting in the details, they can kind of see. Um, and then you can see here's a later one. Once it's been refined a lot, uh, once a lot of feedback has been given, then we kind of refine the, the concept again. And this is the, the final concept. Uh, so once the concept is finalized, they usually will get sent off to a modeler, and they will model the monster um, based on this. Sometimes it'll change a little bit, but this one got pretty uh, close. Um, so this yeah. is, again, this is the X-Commander, and we got both an armored version and an unarmored version of him. I love that you can see the real-world examples, and I think I'm cheating a little bit because I read the notes on, you know, well, here's some bark, and that's that's where that should go, and here's here's, like, the material for his torso. But you can see how that translated into game, and you can see the different pieces and yeah, the different parts yeah. and how they all fit onto the creature. So uh, once uh, you know, we get, w actually kind of during this modeling phase, we'll usually get what we call blue model, uh, which is uh, an untextured version that just has the basic oh. shape um, assigned to uh, a skeleton and everything. So I can start prototyping skills. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times the skills we prototype, uh, I'll work closely with Brian to actually get, or another animator to get uh, the animations we need. We'll go back and forth quite a bit on, okay, we want him to have a heavy swing. You know, what are the timings on that swing? How much warning should the players get before he does that? Um, yes. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, an example of some early animations for this guy. Here's it with an actual green model this time instead of a blue <laughs> model. But oh. yeah. That walk, actually, I don't think ended up making it into the no, final thing. I think we yeah. were trying out yeah. some different postures, yeah. but it eventually it just didn't work out with how you'd need to blend into other animations. So here's my question. Looking at this animation, you were talking about like if he has a heavy swing and how he moves and meshing all of that stuff together. Because right here, it almost looks like he's just swinging something that weighs six ounces. How do you, how do you give weight to... How do you give weight to these things and the movements? Um, well, a lot of it comes down to timing. So if you want to really sell weight, then mm -hmm. you got to like kind of add in a bunch of anticipation and get ready for the swing. And then you do the strong hit. I'm hitting my dodge key really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's also a cool thing to help designers because, you know, 
they can come up with a skill idea that's mm -hmm. like, okay, we want him to show it's this powerful attack, and we want to show the powerful attack, and we need that time also. Mm -hmm. So, All right. That, that makes sense. And trying to build this thing and mesh what it looks like, what he does, how he moves, and what his skills are is it's way more than just you guys. Yeah, I mean, once the skills are placed, along with working with the animators, we have you know, a group of effects artists that will make effects to try to reinforce the skills we do. Um, you know, sometimes we'll want the monster to glow as he's charging up to give the player a chance, you know, more indication <gasps> that they need to oh, yeah. move. Um, and there's pretty much just a lot of back and forth the whole time, a lot of iteration. Um, usually, you know, for the Axe Commander, I think I probably did like eight skills or something at one point for them, but they only ended up with a hand, you know, we, we don't use all those skills because too many skills ends up being, you can't, can't figure out what the monster is oh going gosh. to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and sometimes they just, they're, I, I won't ever get to a skill if we have too many skills on their list. Mm -hmm. um, and then just goes to, once we get them all put together, it goes to play testing. We play test it with, you know, a small group of people just on the team. And we, you know, we'll get feedback from Colin and our team leads and all that kind of thing and our other, other designers. It kind of goes through probably, I, I wouldn't even guess the number of iteration <laughs> phases because it just goes back and forth with increasing groups of, or increasing larger groups of people until we mm -hmm. get it to where we feel like it's a solid uh, design. Oh, wow. And that, it sounds quick on here, but over the time, it's probably several months before a monster goes from, you know, concept to mm -hmm. completion. And then even after that, we'll be tweaking it even, you know, before launch based off of player feedback, mm -hmm. you know, once something goes to the uh, alpha play tests and the, the beta play tests. And, um, all of that, yeah. just putting it through all of those iterations and yeah. putting it through his paces. Um, we talked about, I mean, you know, we're looking at the Axe Commander, and we talked a little bit about the Mordor Maggot was one that we pulled from an, an existing rig and is a good example of this iteration. Yeah. Um, it grosses me out, but, you know. So the Mordrum Maggot uh, was based off of the Grub rig. Mm -hmm. uh, we just wanted some kind of Mordrum Worm. I um, actually have this set to oh, yeah. half speed right now. This is an amazing testing lobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do stuff in kind of an empty area, so we could just focus on the monsters in a lot of cases. Um, so one of the cool things that Brian and I wanted to do with the Mordrum Maggot was we decided... Uh, you know, his standard skills, he was not, went to, wasn't meant to be a super hard monster or anything. He's kind of a, a baseline monster. Um, but we wanted to have him a little unique thing. So we gave him the ability to split himself when he dies. Ew. Um, <laughs> this is not my favorite yeah. creature, you guys. <laughs> yeah. And that actually just kind of came off of, you know, okay, what do, what do worms kind of do? Well, one of the things, I don't, I'm not sure how scientific it is, but we always heard, you know, worms, if you cut them in half, they still, you know, they become two worms, so. You know, if we're going to go down the <laughs> science road, I call um, down fire from the yeah, sky in the yeah. game, so, you know. Um, so, one of the interesting things about this guy is that uh, we started off using the model as the missile. So, what's happening is when he dies, mm -hmm. he actually spits two missiles off of him, and when they land, they spawn a smaller version and we just used his model uh, as the missile as a put instead of getting an effects. And then Brian just did some special animations for him. Yeah, so I had to do a couple of unique animations. One of him rolled up in a ball spinning, and that would be the <gasps> missile oh, animation. Yeah. And then there was a second animation of when he hits the ground to have him like pop out and be ready to attack you. So even just that tiny little split second thing, mm -hmm. you're still having to think, all right, how does this move? Mm -hmm. What is it doing? Why is it doing that? Yeah, and how can we get it to work? How can we communicate through this through all the pieces of animation? Yeah, yeah and and we didn't want to make it look like it just appears out of nowhere when it lands. So you know, we get effects that kind of cover <laughs> up the spawn uh, to some degree, and we try to get the unlurk, what we call the unlurk animations, to match the the animation of when it hits the ground, mm -hmm. um, just to make it look s somewhat smooth. Yeah. Yeah, kill I some more of them. Yeah, kill some more of them, please. <laughs> so unlurk is is that when they're spawning? Yeah, unlurk okay. is one. It's not a not every monster has an unlurk though. Uh, monsters going forward, as a matter of polish, we kind of want them to all have unlurks mm -hmm. from now on. Basically, it just makes them so they don't fade in. The, yeah. the traditional MMO, fa the monster fades in when it spawns. We would mm -hmm. rather have them like come out of the ground or yeah. you know fly in from the sky, uh, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. It just it adds a little a level of polish that uh, it does yeah um as a player it's something that i've noticed where something's crawling out of the ground and it, and it gives you that moment of oh no or oh yay xp <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> all right how many times does he split i forget he only splits yeah what twice. is this like a hydra or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like they they'll split once into smaller ones and these guys will split and then 
the last smaller guys. Oh here my gosh, play. stop just, it. They <laughs> just die. And the, yeah, the one thing we had to do is I think the first time I put them in, I forgot to make the smaller ones uh, <laughs> not worth so much XP. I think there was some. Actually, this and one of the other bosses I did that spawned monsters, like people were were actually purposely not killing the mon the boss so they can get infinite spawns. So we usually oh my gosh. when additional ones spawn we try to we try to make them worth a little bit less. Yeah. Um the other right. example yeah. we wanted to show uh, I love these little guys. This is mainly an example of iteration we had. So the mushroom bombers, the early phase of the mushroom bombers, they actually just spawn like their their thing is they spawn small sporlings that run at the player and explode. I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the early version, it just spawned the guy in place and he'd run. Um, but the feedback we had during playtesting, some internal playtesting, was that the people at range had no, felt no danger from these yeah, guys. Yeah, you're just like plinking away at it from far away. So yeah, so uh, to combat that, I decided to make them actually throw a few of their mushrooms at the player. Uh, and then they would spawn one there, they would throw one uh, at range. <laughs> I love them so much. They're little feet. And then, yeah, my little, uh, that's the maggot again. Oops. Let me spawn another mushroom bomber. Oops. Yay. So my little secret is that I use the same trick I had before. Are they fighting of, each of, yeah, they're fighting each other. <laughs> what? Of, uh, <laughs> We actually <laughs> use the model as a missile shrunk down, and it, it's kind of hard to see in these cases. But uh, <laughs> let me change. Let me spawn another one and lower the. Uh, I think we need to do a show scale. where we just pit monsters against each other and see. Stop that would fighting, be fun. you guys! We're trying to look at you. <laughs> so. All right. Yeah. I set the time at half. You'll actually see, the. Uh, All right. The m the sporling do a little uh, cannonball sometimes. Like he'll tuck his feet in at the end <laughs> before he hits the ground. What? And Can that was just, you'll never see that. It's probably diff too difficult to ever see in game, yeah. but I know it's there, so it makes me happy. Can you go in first person view so we can see it better? Ow, and please tell me uh, you're like what is immortal. the first person view key? I uh, go into know. your options. Yeah, I never go, I never play first person. Uh, uh, options uh, up top. Oh, options. Uh, no, you had it, you had, oh, it. had it. Okay. I always go into dev menu. When now I see where options. it says first person camera. Uh, There's an actual camera blocking my view, so I can't see where it is. But first person field of view. All right, now this is hard. Oh, oh enable first person camera right there above restore defaults to above restore defaults. Oh, there he is. Thank you. And then I think you just zoom into uh, that's your head it. and now you just go into get first rid of that person. And zoom in. Yep. Ah, there we go. All right, now we can see better. I forgot to ask you about that earlier, and then I was like, oh, I can't remember where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can see him shooting the guy out. Oh, that's right, funny. There he tucks in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't that think we could have planned that any better. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I mean that's so kind of. So he does a little cannonball with his knees tucked yeah, up. Yeah, and that's kind of an example of the iteration we usually try to do based off of feedback. Um, mm -hmm. I don't so know. So people are asking the important questions. Yeah. Mushroom butts. Who did oh. that? <laughs> that was uh, an, an artist, uh, Jim, who's actually. Uh, I don't know why he chose to give them butts. Yeah. I think. I it mean, it's funny. I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's their anatomy. They got two legs. Yeah, you got. <laughs> you got a butt. Yeah. I mean, what do you? Yeah, what do you call a mushroom? <laughs> I mean, there's no mushrooms in two legs to with two legs to kind of. So I, I think uh, that's the that's the end of the sentence. There, there's no mushrooms with two legs so in the real who, world. Who's to say they don't have a butt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Prove it. Yeah. The other weird thing, like people, I don't know if they know, like the mushrooms are based on the script rig. You yeah. might have talked about oh, it. Yeah, last we thing. mentioned that so last yeah, uh, time we were on. One yeah. example of how we try to stretch those rigs as far as we can go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. If, <laughs> you guys heard what Mark said. Yeah. <laughs> really, you guys? Yeah, really? <laughs> Mark, Mark's mushrooms. in my ear going, the players want to see the mushroom butts. Uh, let me see if I respawn him again. We need another mushroom. I have the, I have the things. Oops, oh, the commands again. if you need it. No make it. Yeah, what was the number for the mushroom? Don't have them memorized. There. Yeah, all right. a Do you butt. all feel better now? <laughs> <laughs> this <sighs> we are classy. We've, got, we've, gone some, we've gone some strange directions. <laughs> Fungus yeah. butts. Yeah. All right. So there's this. I wanted to see another little cannonball. Oh, okay, they're fighting with the more oh, maggot yeah, again. Yeah. That's hilarious that they went in there and started. Yeah, we actually one try another. to set up um, 
family like we call them families but they have, each family of monster will have an affinity set that says <gasps> really? who they can attack and who they can and who they're aggro against and the mushrooms and the mordrum don't like don't necessarily always get along so we made them I didn't fight know each other. That. yeah we do that for a lot of the monsters will have the same ones um but a lot of them well all of them um but we yeah we try to do a unique one for every family of monsters so when I'm running through Hearthorns and there's like a raptor fighting a random warthog. Yeah, their families don't get along. <laughs> so it's it's like, like the Hatfields yeah. McCoys here. <laughs> but I appreciate it because then I can get to where I'm going. If I don't feel like stopping and fighting that raptor, I'm like, thanks, just leave me out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going over here. There's an airship cargo and I need it. <laughs> well, okay, so they all have things that they'll fight and things that they'll just bypass peacefully. Yeah, sometimes they won't care. Sometimes they're allies, uh, you know, that type of thing. Wow. All right. That wasn't in the script, but I'm yeah. so glad you said it. Awesome. Happy accident. Nope. I'll take it. I like it. Um, let's see. What else do we have? We've got the mushroom bombers. Um, we were talking about the vampire beast. I was like, I know there was another thing. The vampire beast and the bat mother were just good examples of how many teams are involved in yeah, how you the, guys work um, together. The bat mother was kind of a thing. So we... That was like a special boss request that we got from the content team saying, we need a boss in this area. It's in a cave. I'm like, what can we do that we haven't done a lot of in HOT? And yeah. I know bats are fairly common in other parts of the game, but we haven't used a lot of it in HOT, so we decided to make a bat boss. And that was another one Brian and I worked on uh, quite a bit together, Yeah, um, getting the animations for it because it spawns little batlings. We were like, well... Well, first of all, we're like, what what should a bat boss do? And yeah. I'm like, Brian, what what would it look like if a <laughs> boss had a sonic attack? And what was your response? It was like, I was like, you mean like a Zubat? <laughs> yeah, a Zubat from Pokemon. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> and uh, it turns out we can't just take that thing whole, no, wholesale, so, and stick it in our game. Uh, so we made the other thing that Content wanted the boss to do was to take advantage of some mushrooms that were in the area, um, some of the mastery mushrooms. So. Uh, the masteries in the area, I think, were the the poison clearing uh, mastery, where you can use like the this thing to clear off okay. bad effects. So, one of the attacks that the bat mother ends up doing spits these poison pools all over the place that just put a whole bunch of bad things, bad conditions on you. So, if you have the mastery, the mushrooms are nearby to clear those off, but you have a little tougher time if you don't have the mastery. Um, and then the funnest, I think, attack we did for him, that at least for us to make, was the one for, or actually, I should say for her, actually, it was to spawn the uh, her batlings. Um, do you have the number for her? Uh, yeah, here. It's like all the way down below the questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So I have to scroll way down. Oh, Batmother. So, oh, it's it's Batmother. Bat That's yeah. literally the, the <laughs> command <laughs> is Batmother. Let me kind of scale back to one. Actually, what's the, the there's a command for her skill, too. Uh, where'd it go? Yeah, and this was this one. This is all Scroll I up the other way a little bit. This way? Yeah. Uh, oh, Batmother 7. There we go. Oh, okay. And this was one that was kind of a challenge for animation. How do, how do we make how do we make a bat spawn other bats? Yeah. And so I kind of had the idea, like a vampire, maybe she, like, puts her wings up and, like, it. Like Brian a vampire does these cake. motions when he's figuring them out. <laughs> you should see him at his desk sometimes. I love that. <laughs> yeah, well, as an animator, you have to like feel yeah. what it and feels like. So yeah. Get it on the creature. All right, so can we do her? S can we see her summon one more time? Yeah. Or will we just wind up with like a million batlings and everything's it's terrible? Okay. We can have <laughs> we can have a few batlings. <gasps> nice. The other uh, interesting thing we did about yeah. that was their unlurk animation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we utilized that unlurk thing again with the. Um, the maggot, where I created two special unlurks so they would swoop in counter circles and have a little bit more dynamic mm -hmm. entrance. And not just, bink, here's yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right, so that was our Batmother. What was the other one? Uh, vampire Beast? Yeah, we can talk about the Vampire Beast a little bit. Because otherwise we're going to talk about the Bat Guano hero <laughs> point and we're going to have some arguments. Do you have the number for that one, too? There's too many Bat Vampire Beast moths. Vampire, oh, vampire Beast, beast crawler. crawler. There we go. I like when they're things that make sense and not just random numbers. Because <laughs> y'all confuse me when it's like, here's seven numbers to memorize and some of the thing. So, yeah, uh, when coming up with these Vampire Beasts, we kind of wanted to do something a little bit different with them. Um, and so, actually, we created a new 
uh, condition that unfortunately can't be cleared. We called vampir vampiric infection, which is this is the thing that gave mm -hmm. people a lot of trouble because it actually heals the boss for the damage it does to you, um, and it puts it out in a cone sometimes. So there's a if you're all in there, it can get a lot of healing at once. And I, <laughs> I did right after launch. I got into a group that did the, the one at the mastery uh -huh. point. So when he scrolls up to legendary or champion, he gets a lot harder. Uh. Um, and we had a probably group of four or five people that did it. it we were able to maintain damage the whole time, but we couldn't get him down until f you know people figured out to get their pets out of the area and you know watch out for the attack. And it was a pretty rewarding experience watching people yeah. struggle and not. They were able to beat it, <laughs> but you know as a designer, you, as you, you're kind of at both. You you kind of want your monster to kill somebody every once in a well, while. Yeah. But uh, as a player, you know you obviously you want to win. So it was yeah. it was a rewarding experience watching us beat the you know the. The, the challenge, but and it wasn't a pushover. Yeah, the fact that it was a challenge. Yeah, yeah so I found that out the hard way. I was running around with a minion master. Mm -hmm. That that didn't <laughs> yeah. end well, and then people <laughs> yelled at me, and it was not it was not cool. Uh, your one HP is like really hanging in there. Yeah, I, I made him no death. So yeah, he it, die. it always is really gratifying when I do that on yeah. a dev client. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, just go ahead, keep hitting me, but yeah. that what that last HP is not going away. I don't, you didn't work on the animations for him. No, uh, I didn't. That was uh, Mayhew. Yeah. yeah. That was Mayhew? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Scott. I like it. All right, so do you guys feel like taking some questions, or do yeah. you want to go through anything else? Let's, oh, let's tackle I'm, some I'm questions. Cool questions. I have yeah. questions for you. All right. All right, and all right. So the guys told me I have to be the one to figure out how to pronounce these <laughs> names. <laughs> so I would like to thank RF Darko for submitting a question. <laughs> Let me start with something easy. Yeah. Um, what, if any, other games did you look to when designing the new jungle enemies, either in terms of combat mechanics or art design? We already know Pokemon. Yeah, that was <laughs> one. I mean, for me, there's not like I can't. It's hard to s point at a specific one because mm -hmm. you know I've been gaming for 35 plus years at this point, and now it's. That level of it's there's stuff in your yeah, yeah it's in your head and sometimes you pull stuff out that I'm sure it's been used somewhere but it's just stuff that was in your head from playing a game when you were a kid or playing a recent game. Uh, I've been thinking about skills for stuff from like Triforce Heroes now because we've been playing that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so every once in a while I think of I wonder if I could turn that into a skill in our game. So th yeah. these things kind of just come up that way. I don't know what Brian yeah might have a different answer for me. When we were making Hot, I was playing a lot of Monster Hunter 4, mm -hmm. and that game has super awesome animations for their creatures that you're fighting. And something that I borrowed is they do a lot of, like during the fight and the struggle, when the monsters get stunned, you really feel the sense of struggle in the monster. Yeah. So for the Chalk Jarrett, when I when the break bar happens, mm -hmm. I have his stun where he's like clawing and trying to climb out of the hole Whoa. that you knocked him down into, and that was yeah. kind of inspired by that game. So you can have, there are like single games where a particular element made an impression on you, but it's a lot of that just growing up as a gamer and having a feel, having a feel for things. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's the way it comes down to a lot of it. Most of the skills, like for the monsters, mm -hmm. are usually, um, I, I look at the monster model and like, what do I think this guy could do? Sometimes I've even Googled like real life equivalents of monsters and said, you know, what do I think this monster might do if it was, or this animal would do if it was a monster type thing. Yeah, that's uh, valid. Yeah. So there, there's the inspiration comes from pretty much all yeah. different sources. Yeah. And, you know, taking, taking from real life, I remember a story I heard ages ago from one of our artists, and I can't remember who it was. It was at the old office um, before we moved out here. And they were talking about how there was like a dead crow in the parking lot and they were out there drawing the feathers to oh, pull yeah. inspiration. I uh, remember from the first Guild Wars where there was like there were like the crow wings, mm -hmm. and they were kind of a little bit broken and battered. That's if I remember correctly, that's where the inspiration for that came from. So taking it from real life is yeah, happens a lot. Yeah, is something that has a huge history. Oh yeah, because yeah. I mean, with art, we're making imaginative stuff, but you won't believe it unless there is that element of realism right. in there. Mm -hmm. So that kind of goes back for me to the work you're doing on the Enlurks, where they're actually coming out of coming out of the ground or swooping in from the sky. Yeah, it's the same thing. All right, um, how about the Swede? Well, thank you guys for having easy names. I love it. <laughs> uh, will we see more enemies with more specified roles from here on out? I love the fact that there are so many different kinds in Hot that focus on different things, like floppers, menders, healers, punishers, and I hope you keep going down this route. 
Yeah, I think that's something we definitely want to try to do. Maybe not for every single monster. Like some monsters will be able, have a wider variety of uh, roles, but a lot of them, especially when they fit in with a larger army, we'll want them to have a, you know a specific role in that army. So when we group them together, uh, you know they'll complement each other to some degree. Yeah, and I think it adds a cool element of character yeah. to giving them a mm -hmm. specific class yeah. to kind of be. So it's it's a place you want to keep on going. Yeah, definitely. Can we talk about the more Menders? Because, oh my gosh, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, none of us, I don't think either yeah. of us worked on the Menders. That was yeah. Kevin. Immediately absolve all responsibility. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did not do it. Yeah. All right. Up. I like it. Um, how about from Orpheal? Oh, hey. Will we see more creatures from the first Guild Wars? Maybe that will return to the world of Tyria. I can give a strong maybe. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. I don't. We, we can't really talk too much about yeah. future plans, but we definitely look. Uh, whenever we're pulling new monsters in, that's something we know we have a large backlog of monsters in our you know IP that we can pull from, and we definitely yeah. use that for inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, we might pull monsters and tweak them to you know what would they look like in our time frame, but. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some more Guild Wars 1 monsters in the future. Awesome. Uh, Stand the Wall. Is it hard to design an NPC to react effectively in most situations? Because when you in introduce the human element, you've got all these players in there. Different things are going to happen. Yeah, there's always a really difficult line we have to walk between what's fun and um, you know what you'd want, you'd expect a monster to behave intelligently. Like, Making a monster that dives out of all your AUEs and tries to kite you the whole time might sound you know, a lot more fun than it, in uh, theory than it actually is in practice. It doesn't sound uh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can definitely... I, I think for standard mobs, we're not going to make them get too horribly more intelligent. We tried to get them harder and hot, and I think we came to a pretty good level of difficulty. Though I think we can do better of making some of the more unique monsters, like the boss monsters and stuff, maybe have a little bit more intelligent AI. Mm -hmm. And we definitely have some new tools that we might be using in the future for that. Nice. Sounds like a conversation we'd want to bring an AI guy in for. And yeah. we're out of chairs right now, and <laughs> we didn't plan on that. So, uh, Let's see. Ben K. Seriously, you guys, thank you for having easy names. I love it. If you're making a new pet, what do you have to keep in mind for gameplay considerations, and what do you like to do to give it character? Since we had some new pets in Hot. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of the pets in Hot were taken from just creatures we had already done and spent a lot of time on. It's kind of another one of those, hey, we did all this animation work and creature work on this guy. Hey, maybe he's cool enough yeah, to the, be uh, a <laughs> pet. The class team, <laughs> several of the pets were definitely just direct monsters, and then they would just modify the skills to be appropriate for a, a player class. Yeah. We don't make those specifically, but they definitely u reuse a lot of our work. Yeah. Uh, so we like work close. Yeah, pet. we're close with that team. They sit right next to us. So, yeah. There's a good reason for that, yeah. evidently. <laughs> cool. Um, oh, man. Okay. Might be Shoji. Might be Shogai. I don't know. It's G-E-I. But they want to know, when an Etten swings a club at you... Oh, I loved this question. When an Etten swings a club at you, what is the size and shape of the damage field? Hold on, because we're not done. <laughs> is it tight to the club? Is it a tube around the club? A moving box or a cone in front of the creature that simply activates when the Etten swings the club through it. How do clubs work? There's actually not really a simple answer to this. Well, okay, the complicated answer is we can actually do, we have a lot of different options for how we apply the d the, the damage. In most cases, though, it's just going to be a cone in front of the creature mm -hmm. um, that we try to make match the animation and the model. So we make sure the damage cone doesn't go too far outside of where the, <laughs> the, the it's monster's like nine feet on either side. Um, but yeah, so I mean, usually it's just a cone. But we we actually have a lot of different options for how we want really? to do the damage field. Okay. Yeah. We so could do it in a circle around it. We could do it in a, you know, a, a square rectangle in front of it. Um, but we usually go the easiest route, depending on the the skill. However, it makes sense. Like, like the, a simple cone will you know will do pretty well for a a, a club swing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You don't have to worry about, okay, now it needs to move with the club. It's just here's where he can go. Here's yeah. his reach. And they don't usually move. Well, some of their animations do, but for a simple swing, they probably will stand in place and swing, so we don't have to worry too much about the, the damage area moving. And it usually goes so quickly. Like, it's usually less than a second, you know, at one point of uh, when the damage occurs. So if you're in that spot when he swings, you're pretty much going to get hit. <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty much done. Yeah. 
Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. This question came up so many times. Ult Ultima Stanza. I think I got this right. We should do like a betting pool on how many of these I mess up now because they're getting harder. In regards to creatures, have you given any thought on possibly creating an in-game bestiary? Yeah. So many people ask this. Yeah, I really did like this question. It was a cool idea. But unfortunately, it's not something that our team would actually ever be assigned to make. That's mm -hmm. uh, it would be a new system. If I was assigned to it, there's definitely a lot of cool things I think we could do with the Beast Jerry. Um, but that would usually be a completely different team's uh, function to do. That seems that feels like more than one team. Yeah. Would they would take our monsters. Um, I'm not even sure what team would do that. Maybe the rewards team, depending on how they wanted to do it. Like if there was rewards for you know uh, finding new monsters or unlocking different tracks for killing mm -hmm. you know specific i mean there's so many things you could do with that i guess it would yeah. depend on what we decided the end design would be depending on what team would implement it but it could definitely go a lot of different ways so in my head i mean when we went through these questions i was thinking oh these are good questions you know you guys you guys picked out the questions you liked and oh i'm gonna be interested to see what they say and now i'm sitting here going oh my gosh that's like that's like the rewards team and that then there's a ui element yeah there's and UI then there's and lore and lore team I mean, it'd be a lot of different teams combining to make yeah. one thing i don't know which team would own the final design <laughs> oh yeah it could be <laughs> no yeah. idea yeah. yeah that got complicated super fast but yes it is a cool idea um and that's kind of all we have on that particular question yeah i wish i wish we could say yes Done. <laughs> yeah. I wish it was that easy, <laughs> if only. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about Mickey, Mickey, Mighty? Mike, Mike, I, Mighty, could be. Um, when creating new monsters and creatures that have some reference in the first Guild Wars, how strict, how strict do you stick to how they looked, and how much freedom do you have to update them? I think we do have a lot of freedom. I mean, we have hundreds of years of evolution here. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it comes down to you want to stay true to what it was, mm -hmm. but y that Guild Wars 1 was made so long ago. You got to update and you just want to make it cooler mm -hmm. and look more uh, modern day game. <laughs> There's a common trope in game design that whenever somebody else takes the same they're gonna if you you hand um, one monster off or one design element off to a new designer mm -hmm. they're gonna want to put their own stamp on it as much as possible um, that's valid so a lot of times you know we would take an existing monster but we want to see you know how can we ramp this up or mm -hmm. you know how can i put my own spin on this yeah we'll not just take like the old work was great i mean there was a reason it's yeah. there and the reason why people loved it but well how can we stay true to the spirit of the monster and mm -hmm. Um, you know, make it fit in Guild Wars 2 while yeah. at the same time making maybe make something unique about it that didn't have before. Yeah. So you're still staying true to it. It's not like, okay, these things had two legs, now they have six. Right. It's yeah. <laughs> what would they look like in modern day yeah. in Guild Wars 2. And then, you know, our 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 spec is higher than it was for Guild Wars 1, so we yeah. can do more you know, than they could back then in terms of, you know, poly count and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So. That's got to be so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This might be my favorite question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pocket Raptors. Let's talk about Pocket Raptors. Where did the inspiration come from? Why do you hate us? That last part <laughs> might be from me. Oh. Uh, and what are the statistics? I'll answer this one first because okay. we went and found the answer. Yeah. What are the statistics of player deaths to Pocket Raptors? Pocket Raptors have been responsible for 1,286,817 player deaths. <laughs> Probably more now because yeah. that question and answer came yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there was a specific uh, inspiration for them, but they did end up being very close to uh, Jurassic Park, the little dinos in Jurassic Park, <laughs> that swarm. Um, I kind of like the way they, we kind of knew that they were going to turn out that way because they killed a lot of people internally too before, <laughs> the, before, yeah. they, before we actually released the game. But we decided because it was something that you can combat pretty, as long as you see them first and you, you take the initiative and don't try to run through them, you're generally fine. Yeah, once but you learn how to fight them, yeah, you're pretty good. Yeah, not too bad. AoE is your friend. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. Yeah, so trying to run through them is a thing... <sighs> All right. I want to say that I have learned the hard way, except I still haven't learned. I'm still like, I'm a guardian. It's fine. You know, <laughs> save yourselves. Was it like super deliberate to make sure we couldn't run through them or was it just no, a happy I think, accident? I think that was somewhat happy accident because they're so small, they're hard to see. And mm -hmm. the way the way the uh, um, 
the content designers spawn them. They spawn them in a lot of shadowy places. This just happen to be shadowy places. So, <laughs> like you'll, I've I've experienced the same thing. You'll see like, oh, there's little, there's two little guys right there. That's it's no big fine. deal. I'll just yeah. go there, and then you go there, and oh my god, they're everywhere. <laughs> there are like five hundred uh, of them. So usually, even if I see one, I just I play an elementalist as my primary character, and I I'll just start dropping AOEs on him as soon as I see yep. them because I know there's more in there, <laughs> I, whether I can see them or not. I know they're there. Flush them out with fire. Yeah, pretty much. Oh my gosh. All right, so here's one from Gemeltier. Probably right. Currently, I am doing a 3D arts and animation school here in Austria. My big goal is to suddenly work in a major game studio. And what are some good hints you can give to a newbie character creature artist? Well, go. This one comes up a lot, and mm -hmm. it's kind of a simple answer, but it really is the most accurate. Just find that thing you want to do if you want to be a character creature artist then just make characters and creatures. Just go do it. I mm -hmm. mean, I didn't become an animator by not animating. I spent all, a lot of my free time animating stuff I thought would be cool, and then going to school and learning animation also. Mm -hmm. And it's the combination of having the passion to want to keep improving yourself and working on it, and tr some training that makes you, I feel like, mm -hmm. a good artist, animator, yeah. whatever you want to become. But doing it is actually animating is the thing, not just, okay, I'm going to wait until I'm perfect, yeah. and I've learned all of these things, and then I will start animating. Oh, it's yeah. Do the thing. You're going to do some things that you then just throw away, and then you're like, all right, well, that project is done. It maybe didn't turn out how I wanted. Okay, let's just do the next. I've learned my lesson. I can mm -hmm. approach it differently this time, and you just keep getting better and mm -hmm. learning. Ben? Uh, well, for the design side, it's kind of weird because I actually have a business degree. I didn't go to school for game design. Uh, I didn't go to school for this either. But they didn't so. have they didn't, the game design schools didn't exist. You know, when I was <laughs> in college in the in the nineties. Um, so I, I kind of got my experience with muds starting out, uh, like being a mud a wizard on a mud programming there, um, uh -huh. and then just sticking with it. Uh, I started I started off in like CS and then kind of went from there, but. In terms of how to get into the industry from the design side, I would just there's so many tools available now that we didn't have back in those days. That now, if you want to make a game, you can make a game. There's there's no shortage of options out there, and so I would just like make mods, um, you know, make your own skins for games, make your own nice. just make your own games, even if it's just on pen and paper. Like we all look at that kind of thing when we're looking at new candidates. Like you know, what do they do? What how did like what are their design uh, ideas? So like make your own D and D modules. Just like if you want to design, it's the same thing. Design, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and then hopefully eventually you'll get recognized for it and you'll get a shot. Yeah, and recognize maybe that you're not going to be absolutely pro. No, from right, the away. right out of <laughs> yeah. the gate, like you have 20 years of experience. Right. It's yeah. it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the cool thing nowadays <laughs> with the internet is there's so much community and sharing that you can do some work, put it out there, get feedback from other people. And then improve yourself and yeah, just see so what people think and like. Stuff out yeah. There. Yeah. So it sounds like Gemmel's off to a good start. He's asking the right questions. And he or she, I actually don't know, is asking <laughs> the right questions and going to school. So start designing. Make creatures. Design things. Awesome. All right. We have one more question that I deliberately saved for last. And what is your favorite Heart of Thorns enemy? And what is your least favorite to fight? Oh, that's from Safan. Safan, Safan, Safan. Um, well, for me, one of my favorite, it's like an event monster, is mm -hmm. the gold guzzler. Just because I think it's really fun oh. to stand on top and just throw all those rocks on. You told me about that the other day, <laughs> and I haven't gone to find it yet, but it's actually called the gold guzzler. Yep. Yeah. And it's it's an arrowhead. It's a champion arrowhead somewhere in the game that I haven't come across yet. Yeah. But okay, so what do you do? You're just throwing rocks on its head. You're yeah. literally. I just like his name, and he's just got a fun little mechanic of throwing rocks on him. <laughs> I love it. And if I'm not mistaken, you can do it from on high, so he can't roll over you. Yeah. That's amazing. I gotta find. You have to show me where this is, or I'll just ask Nelly. She knew about yeah, it. Yeah, she made it. Um. All right. So, what's your least favorite? Uh, least favorite to fight. I don't know. I we mean, can freeze it most infuriating, <laughs> if that will help. I think, yeah, for me, the mushrooms, I think. What? <laughs> Is it because they swarm you too much? Yeah, or? there's too much swarming. I always get knocked down and just killed. Play a daredevil. Get that third dodge bar. It helps. <laughs> Makes a difference. What about you, Ben? Um, 
My favorite is mainly because I worked on him so much. Is I really like the Axe Commander. Um, mm -hmm. He was just fun to create and fun to make the animations for. Um, and the fact that he's kind of a prominent boss monster is kind of fun. So watching him march down the lanes in uh, Dragon Stand is really really fun because he, mm -hmm. he stands out so much. He's also killed a lot of people. <laughs> that I don't, makes you I, happy. I don't know the exact number, but he has killed a lot of people. Yeah, we should have got uh, those stats too. Yeah, I should have. Uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, like, that's why you like him? That's one of the reasons I like have him. Have you met Peter Freeze? At uh, all? I think <laughs> so, probably. Uh, <laughs> he really, I do he like to kill players. That's part of my job description, though, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and my least favorite, I probably get annoyed by the chalk uh, because of all their missile shields and missile reflex. I've killed myself mm. more than I'd like to admit because uh, I'm not fast <laughs> enough on hitting the escape key from yeah. <laughs> to stop my auto attack. Stop hitting, stop yeah. hitting. Stop hitting yourself, yeah. That happens <laughs> a lot. Um, can, we get an anime, can we get a skill called that? Stop, stop hitting, hitting yourself. yourself. Oh, uh, the class team should do one like that. <laughs> all right, guys, get on that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I am giving a totally opposite answer. The mushrooms are my favorite. Oh, they yeah. crack me up to watch. They are so funny. And I can't believe neither of you said that the smoke scale was your least favorite. Yeah. That might have, I, that thought about that one because getting them out of that smoke screen is kind of a pain. Oh, but my gosh. I am like immediate. As soon as I see him start coming at me, I'm mad. I mean, like, he's not even <laughs> here yet, and I'm angry about this. He dies pretty quick if you can get him out of the smoke screen. You know, it's mostly just running and screaming for yeah, me and nah, trying to find yeah. a cliff to jump off of so I can glide away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was our last question. Thank you guys, really, for coming in, yeah, showing us welcome. behind the curtain of animation and showing us the rigs for all of these things. So now you guys know Bristleback used to be a quaggan, <laughs> but he got different <laughs> animated. That was my big takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We will see you guys next week. I'm going to let the two of you get back to work. Thank you, guys. Don't Thanks forget to follow our channel here on Twitch so you don't miss our future live streams. And we will see you next Friday on Guild Chat. Bye. Bye.